the structure of concrete and here I am giving an example already with scanning electron microscopy ok. This is a structure of concrete taken with the help of uh, or, uh, or imaged with the help of backscatter SEM ok. We will talk in detail about this technique when we get there, but this backscatter SEM technique was used to actually uh, determine this internal structure of the concrete. So, you can here see the aggregates which are present some are large some are small ok if you, this size is 200 microns. So, the overall field width is about this is probably about 1.5 millimeter it is quite small still ok it is it's not really big okay. and this is about 1 millimeter at that size scale this is 1.5 by 1 millimeter size that we are looking at. Again we talked about this uh, in the introduction class that we are looking at very small portions of this material which is used in meter scales and we are trying to con convert that to a few millimeters or even sub millimeter scale to take a look at what is actually inside ok. So, you can now understand the challenge that we want to go from this scale to explaining the properties of the concrete compressive strength that you measure in the lab or the performance of concrete in a structure where it is actually a very large beam for instance or a very large column ok. So, the idea here is to look at how the different phases are getting distributed. So, you can see a typical polished surface from a slice of concrete it shows the coarse and fine aggregates of course, this could be a piece of the coarse aggregate, but most of the others which have almost a uniform color those are pieces of fine aggregate that are present in your system. So, coarse aggregate could have some chunks from which are small enough to be viewed here otherwise the size of coarse aggregates is quite large you will not be able to actually see it in this field ok. What you also see is the paste you see this region inside the aggregates that is basically your paste region and the cement paste region is composed of several different levels of grey as you can see from this picture ok. The whitest particles are the unhydrated cement grains unhydrated cement grains that have not reacted with water. The grey different shades of grey are from the cementitious compounds or hydrated products that are forming out of the reaction of cement with water. And of course, you can also see the black spots within the paste those black spots are basically the porosity that is existing within the paste ok. And this porosity is ultimately responsible for most of the properties of your concrete. If you have more porosity you have lesser strength, if you have more porosity that is interconnected you have low durability of the concrete ok. So, strength and durability are dependent on porosity of the concrete. So, again we have classified concrete as a two phase system composed of cement paste and aggregate. We assume that most of the time the aggregates are inert whereas, the structure of the paste keeps evolving with time ok, structure of cement paste keeps evolving with time. And hydrated cement paste is composed of porosity which can be classified as capillary porosity and the hydration product. The structure of the hydration product CSH and other gel like constituents within this hydration product may also have internal porosity in it which is otherwise known as gel porosity ok. CSH is a is also known as CSH gel and the porosity within this gel is also called gel porosity. And the hydration product is not just CSH, but also includes other forms of hydrates like calcium hydroxide, calcium aluminosulfates and so on ok. So, according to Powers, Powers was one of the foremost scientists who worked on cement chemistry in the 1940s and 50s according to powers one third of the pore space is composed of gel porosity and the rest is capillary porosity. So, one obvious question that arises from here is that how do I understand what is gel porosity what is ca capillary porosity are there size scales which define these porosities and that is what we will look at when we deal with characterization techniques for porosity we will see how this porosity can be classified how it can be measured and what is the relevance of the measurement of this porosity with actual properties of the concrete and that is something you will come across later when we deal with porosity uh, pore size analysis. One of the important characteristics of concrete is the presence of this zone called interfacial transition zone. So, we are talking about two dissimilar phases that are combining together to form concrete right? you have the cement paste and the aggregate phase. The issue is when you bring these together the differences of the zone just around the aggregate with the bulk cement paste 
sometimes can lead to very interesting characteristics in the concrete. So, generally researchers agree that porosity of the paste as well as the proportion of calcium hydroxide in the zone just around the aggregate that is the bonding zone between paste and aggregate which is otherwise also known as interfacial transition zone. In this zone the porosity and calcium hydroxide content is much higher than away from this zone. Okay. So, very often we attribute this zone to be the weak link in concrete and generally this is where the first cracks start appearing when the concrete is subjected to any stress or load sorry. And these failure cracks in normal strength concrete tend to travel along this interfacial transition zone because when you actually break a cube and observe the fractured surface in laboratory you will see that the zone around the aggregate is where the failure is developed and not really through the aggregate. Okay. So, again when we strengthen the ITZ or interfacial transition zone by strengthening your paste and lowering your water cement ratio what is going to happen? Your cracking will more progressively go right through the aggregate rather than around the aggregate. So, the for higher strength concrete your cracking is more brittle it goes right through the aggregate. So, again this is a schematic depiction of your interfacial transition zone you have the aggregate here you have the bulk cement paste here and that is your transition zone close to the aggregate. Generally it is agreed that it is around 50 microns from the surface of the aggregate. Okay. About 50 microns from the surface of the aggregate is where you have this interfacial transition zone which is composed of large porosity and many more calcium hydroxide crystals as opposed to your bulk paste. And this is actually a picture taken from close to the aggregate in microscopy which shows a deposit of calcium hydroxide right at the interfacial transition zone. Now, this is something you all know very well that as the water to cement ratio increases your strength decreases. There are obviously limits to where you can actually increase your strength because of compaction right. When you reduce your water cement ratio the strength will increase up to the point where you cannot compact your concrete well enough. Okay. And we also have a rule that is usually used to actually represent the relationship between strength and water to cement ratio it is called Abrams rule Abrams law and of course, this law does not have to follow the same pattern all the time the same uh, power relationship all the time you could have other relationships also describing this characteristic. But the important point to understand is as the water cement ratio increases the strength decreases. Now, concrete is subjected to a host of durability problems in service and many of these are associated with the presence of water okay. because any aggressive chemical is brought to the concrete only by water. If concrete is dry you will really not have a problem, but most of these techniques or most of the problems that are associated with concrete durability involve the presence of water. So, corrosion of steel in reinforced concrete is probably the biggest durability problem followed by other smaller problems which are affecting concrete and not necessarily the steel. So, you have sulphate and other chemical attack like acid or chloride attack for instance, alkali aggregate reaction which is actually because of a reactive aggregate. Okay. Other problems are happening because of reactions with the paste, but alkali aggregate reaction happens because of reactive aggregate and this is when the aggregates themselves are of a glassy nature that means they exhibit some degree of amorphousness and that can happen with some of the volcanic rocks that are commonly used in several countries. For example, if you go to New Zealand you will hardly find an aggregate that is not alkali reactive. Okay. In several other northern European countries also they have to deal only with alkali reactive aggregates because many of the their rocks are of volcanic origin. And then there are problems associated primarily with cold climates of freezing and thawing damage and that happens when water inside the concrete transforms to ice on freezing and converts back to water on thawing. This is associated with the volume change and that volume change leads to cracking in concrete. Now, again just as I said before without water none of these durability problems would happen. That is why the intrinsic characteristic of the concrete that determines its durability is just the permeability of the concrete. Okay. So, permeability is the most important characteristic with respect to durability. Although of course, permeability will not really govern the reactivity of the aggregate it governs everything that leads to transport of aggressive species from the external environment into the concrete. But you will 
if you do uh, uh, read about alkali aggregate reaction, you will see that one of the major reasons why expansion actually happens is because of the imbibing of water and where is this water coming from? From the external uh, surface to the interior of the concrete and again there if you have concrete that is impermeable, it will prevent this water from getting to the reactive aggregate and causing this expansion to happen. So, in all cases having water or presence of water is absolutely important for the durability problem to happen. Now, concrete is subjected to sustained loading during its life cycle and this sustained loading can actually start internally rearranging the structure of your cement paste. Okay. Now, you know that cement paste has a structure that evolves with time and there is lot of porosity inside and because of the sustained loading, you can actually have a continuous rearrangement of the structure. First of all, you may have some extra water that is inside the system that may start getting driven out just like in soils you have consolidation over some time because of a sustained loading water drains out of the soil and that is called consolidation. Just like that in concrete also, the excess water can start getting migrating out of your cement paste regions and migrate to other regions or as associated with drying, you can actually have the drying out of this water also while the water is migrating out of the paste. So, in other words, your internal rearrangement will lead to a volumetric change in the concrete and that is basically called creep. We assume that aggregates are not susceptible to creep because they are much more stiffer than the paste phase. So, in general the higher the volume of aggregates in concrete, the more resistant the concrete would be to creep deformations. Similarly, you have another long term deformation which is called shrinkage and shrinkage just happens because concrete has moisture and this moisture will dry out eventually in a drying environment. Okay. Once again, it is the paste that is susceptible to shrinkage and not the concrete sorry, sorry not the aggregate and because of that the higher the aggregate content, the lesser will be the shrinkage of your concrete. Okay. So, again creep and shrinkage will happen inevitably in any concrete member, but once again the primary defining factor for both of these is the moisture content in the concrete. So, water plays a very important role not just in durability, but also in dimensional stability of your concrete. Okay. Now, of course, uh, shrinkage if it is allowed to happen without any restraint is not really a problem. Only when a restraint happens, cracking occurs in the concrete and that leads to other problems such as ingress of chemicals and water into the concrete quite easily. If there is cracking obviously, the water can enter much easier and that leads to long term durability issues. So, if shrinkage is allowed to happen, there is no problem, but there is going to be restraints which will cause cracking in the concrete. Now, shrinkage itself is composed of several different types like plastic shrinkage, chemical autogenous shrinkage, drying shrinkage and carbonation shrinkage. Of course, it requires a lot of discussion, but we will look at some of the techniques that are applied to studying shrinkage and we will try and characterize some of the different types in that, uh, in that lecture. Okay. All right. So, with that the overview on cement concrete is done, we will see a lot of examples from cement concrete when we discuss characterization techniques. Okay. So, let us now start discussing about asphalt concrete. So, again asphalt concrete is different from cement concrete in, the, in just one regard. Again asphalt concrete is a two phase system, right. you have the continuous phase which is asphalt or asphalt cement it is called, the discontinuous phase is the aggregate. Again you have coarse iron fine aggregate which is used in asphalt concrete. So, instead of cement paste which is cement and water as the binder, in asphalt concrete you have asphalt as a binder. But that is not the only difference, the difference also lies in the means with which the loads are taken by cement concrete and asphalt concrete. Now asphalt belongs to a class of materials called bituminous materials. Okay. So, ASTM definition says that bituminous materials are a class of black or dark colored cementitious substances which are natural or manufactured and which are composed principally of high molecular weight hydrocarbons. So, amongst bituminous materials the most common ones are asphalt, tar, pitch and asphaltite. So, all these are part of this larger family of bituminous materials. 
of course the colloquial usage when you go to speak to any person on the street they will think that everything is made with tar like the roads are made with tar but civil engineers know that it is not tar which makes the pavement it is asphalt or bitumen that actually goes into making of the pavement. But tar has other interesting characteristic for example it can be used to prolong the life cycle of your asphalt pavement because tar does not dissolve in gasoline and other organic solvents whereas asphalt does dissolve in because asphalt is obtained from the same process as gasoline. Okay. So, if you have a petrol spill on your road if there is asphalt on the surface it will start getting dissolved. But if you have a surface treatment done with tar you will be protecting the road surface and prolonging the life cycle of your road. So, of course, natural bitumen can also be found across the world primarily uh, you have bitumens with inorganic impurities like lakes in Trinidad, Venezuela, Cuba and so on and bitumens without any inorganic impurities are also found in pure forms and these are given the mineral names as gilsonite, grahamite, wurzelite, abatite, elatrite and so on. So, these are all found in different locations geographical regions across the world and if you really look at the history of building materials a lot of the past construction where they uh, wanted binders to fix large masonry blocks one of the common binders that people actually used was asphalt before lime and before cement came into being asphalt was one of the natural binders available for actually binding masonry materials. Okay. Artificial bitumen which we are more commonly prone to using these days is formed from different processes. So, the most common one obviously is the petroleum asphalt oil or petroleum asphalt which is obtained from fractional distillation right. This is the process that we commonly see in our refineries. You also have the production of tar or from destructive distillation of coal okay. and you can also get other forms of artificial bitumen like coal tar, water gas tars and pitches okay. But for the most part we deal with asphalt from the petroleum processing industry which is obtained from fractional distillation. So, just to distinguish asphalt and tar asphalt is obtained as residue in the refinement of petroleum it may also be found in natural pools okay. and this is what we use as a binder in pavement construction and it is a long chain hydrocarbon high molecular weight but it is a long chain hydrocarbon. On the other hand tar is obtained from destructive distillation of bituminous coal it is not used in paving but it is used in waterproofing and pavement treatments okay. and major difference is it is a cyclic or aromatic hydrocarbon okay. So, long chain is also called aliphatic cyclic is also called aromatic hydrocarbon. So, that is the primary distinction between these two classes of materials. So, again in the sources of uh, uh, when you do the distillation of your crude oil there are various processes that go from the formation of propane gas to petrol to kerosene to grease and finally you get asphalt as a residue in this process. So, if you look at a refinery the least profitable material for them or actually a waste for them is asphalt but that is gold for civil engineers right because we have to use asphalt for the construction of pavements more than 90 percent 95 percent of the pavements across the world are done with asphalt. So, because the uh, owners of these refineries realize that even this residue or waste can be a very large profit making material as far as its application in construction is concerned. So, these days obviously, you do not get pure asphalt anymore there are a lot of modifications done to the asphalt to make modified binders which have superior characteristics of the pure asphalt. Okay. So, a lot of research is going on in trying to understand the characteristics of the asphalt and how to actually modify or improve the characteristics by using other types of additives into the asphalt also. So, one of the major characteristics of asphalt is its dependent dependence on temperature okay. Like any other polymer asphalt is highly dependent asphalt properties are highly dependent on temperature. At room temperature let us say around 20 to 25 degrees Celsius asphalt is highly viscous the viscosity of the asphalt is about 250,000 poise at room temperature. 
but when you want to actually use this as a payment material if you work with that viscosity obviously it is not going to mix with the aggregate and get compacted to a roadway pavement. So, you have to lower this viscosity to make it suitable for application and this lowering of viscosity is typically done by heating the asphalt in most applications we heat the asphalt ok. But there are other ways to do it also you can make an emulsion. What is an emulsion? Yeah, essentially suspending drops droplets of asphalt in water with an emulsifying agent just like your paint there are, there are also emulsi uh, emulsion paints and those are basically based on suspending your globules of paint in water using an emulsifying agent because paint and water would not mix together ok. So, what happens is when you use this material what happens when you mix with the aggregate and compact it into the roadway pavement the water will simply evaporate leaving the asphalt behind and this asphalt will bind the aggregate. The other way to do it is to dissolve the asphalt in an organic solvent. Now, all these organic solvents that were shown here gasoline, kerosene and so on will be able to dissolve the asphalt because asphalt is obtained from the same process ok. So, when you dissolve it into this organic solvent mix it with aggregate and compact it what will happen to the organic solvent? It will simply volatilize it will go away right leaving behind the asphalt which can then bind the aggregates. So, in all these techniques all you are doing is simply lowering the viscosity. So, the technique used obviously defines the type of asphalt. So, the hot mix asphalt is when the asphalt is heated and the heating temperature typically is 125 to 150 degrees Celsius ok because at that temperature the viscosity is lowered almost to the extent that asphalt is like a liquid at that temperature and it mixes very well with the aggregate it coats the aggregate well and because of that you get a homogeneous asphalt concrete composite. Now, in emulsion 60 to 70 percent asphalt is suspended in 30 to 40 percent water with a emulsifying agent when water evaporates the process is called as breaking ok and cut back is nothing but the dissolved asphalt in an organic solvent uh, low molecular weight organic solvent and essentially when the solvent volatilizes your asphalt remains behind and binds the aggregate ok. So, we have seen now different types of asphalt in the next lecture we will continue with assessment of how this structure of asphalt concrete evolves with time and how does that lead to modifications or rather uh, complications in analysis of asphalt properties. We will also then look at steel as a material and polymers and plastics to wind up this segment and structure of construction materials ok. So, thank you all.